Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. It's good to see you as we gather for worship. A special welcome to you if you're visiting with us this morning. We're glad that you're here. If you are visiting, I would encourage you to take a moment to either fill out one of these visitor cards that you can find in front of you in the pew, or to take a moment and scan the QR code that's on the back of your bulletin. That way, we can let you know more about what's going on in the life of Covenant Church. I always encourage you to read the announcements just inside the front cover and inside the back cover of your bulletin, but I want to highlight uh, three things for you real quickly. One, the Raising Boys and Girls Parenting Conference that we have coming up. You're going to hear a, a ministry spotlight about that later in the service, but I just draw your attention to that announcement. Secondly, um, today's the last day to sign up for our Mexico mission trip. Uh, we've, that has been on hold since before COVID, and now we're finally uh, ready to go back to Mexico again. So I encourage you to sign up for that and to do that today. If you have questions or need to know more about that, you can see Josh Fickert uh, or anyone in the office and let them know about that. Uh, lastly, uh, our missions weekend is coming up uh, next, next Sunday is Missions Sunday, and there, there's all kinds of material and information about our missions weekend. You can sign up for the missions banquet and join a, a table uh, there at the welcome desk. There's also a schedule of activities and events for throughout the week, and we encourage you to join us for those things in the coming week and next Sunday for Mission Sunday. Well, this morning as we, as we gather, we do so because God calls us together into His presence. And when He does, He promises that He will be here among us. His presence is offered for any time two or three gather in His name. So this morning as we pray, as we sing, as we offer ourselves in the tithes and offerings, as we hear the Word preached, as we gather around the Lord's table this morning, we do so in the presence of the Lord. Let's take a moment now to prepare ourselves silently to meet with the Lord. stand together for the call to worship from Psalm 103. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Let us worship God. pray together. Oh God, you are the strength of all who put their trust in you, and you are worthy of all our praises and more besides. Mercifully hear our prayers. Because in our weakness, we can do nothing good without you. Give us the help of your grace that in keeping your commandments, we may please you both in will and in deed. Remember the covenant that you have made with your people, that you are our God, and that we are your people. A covenant that you are always delighted to keep and that you are unswervingly committed to. As we live under your watchful eye and good care, extend to us the protection and safeguard that we need, that our faith would be kept intact and firmly grounded in you. Finally, we ask that more and more we would come to a greater appreciation and a firmer grasp of the adoption that you have secured for us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we gather in God's name, we profess what it is and in whom it is that we believe. We'll do so This morning, using the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answers 26 and 28, I'll read the question, and then let's respond together with the answer. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them? who 
still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is Almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful Father. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father, that nothing will separate us from His love. All creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will they can neither move nor be. be seated. We come into God's presence this morning with His praise on our lips and professing who it is and in whom we believe. And as we do so, we also remember God's holiness and how far short we fall of that. We're going to, this morning, confess our sins, and we'll do that beginning with a corporate confession of sin and then a time of silent confession as well. Let's confess our sins together. Gracious Heavenly Father, You sent the King of Heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord, to subdue our restless hearts and to defend us against all that would bring us spiritual harm. Yet we confess that our hearts remain more apathetic than active, more isolated than involved, more callous than compassionate, more obstinate than obedient and more legalistic than loving. Forgive us for straying from your way. Release us from the bondage of idols that have kept us from knowing your truth. Pardon us for attempting to find life and satisfaction in created things rather than you, our blessed Creator, Lord. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Let's continue now in silent confession. Father, as we come before you naming our sins in a corporate confession of sin and then sitting in a moment of silence and taking inventory of our lives and our failures, our shortcomings, our sins against you. It can be overwhelming to sit before you as we really are, sinners in need of the grace that you offer in Jesus Christ. How grateful that we are, Lord, that as we come confessing our sins, that we can offer our confession in the name of your Son, Jesus, and know that in Him we find forgiveness. And so hear our prayer, we pray, in the name of your blessed Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, lift up your heads and hear 
the good news of the gospel from Ephesians chapter 2. There, this is what Scripture says. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Brothers and sisters, know that as you hear this, the very Word of God, that Forgiveness of sins is offered to you not because of your thorough repentance, not because you've cleaned up your act, but because God is rich in mercy, and He offers you forgiveness in Christ by grace through faith, so that you can know that if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus, that indeed in Him your sins are forgiven, and that is good news. This morning, we have a a baptism, which is always a delight to do, and you will remember, many of you will know, that at the end of Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gathered His disciples and offered what we now refer to as the Great Commission. There, Jesus gathered the 11 remaining apostles, and He said to them that they were to go and make disciples of all nations. They were to do that by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them everything that Jesus had commanded. So Jesus instituted baptism for His followers from that point forward, and we continue to baptize because of what Jesus instituted. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, the day that the church was born, The apostle Peter preached, and in the power of the Spirit, he announced the good news of the gospel, which we just read about in uh, in Ephesians chapter 2. Peter preached that good news, and he offered that promise to all who would trust in Christ, also announcing that the promise offered to believers in Jesus Christ is for believers and for their children. And so this morning, we invite Patrick and Laura Andrews to bring their little one, Wilder, forward for baptism. I'm going to go ahead and invite Elder Bill Hughes to come forward as well to assist in the baptism this morning. And we just read our assurance of pardon from Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to just read you as well. Later on in that letter, a couple chapters later, the Apostle Paul writes this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now this morning, we baptize baptize Wilder into the one body of Christ. He becomes a little member. He's actually not that little. He's pretty... (laughs) He's a pretty good chunk, (laughs) but he becomes one of the littler members of Covenant Church this morning, and by this baptism, he is called, as you heard there, the Apostle Paul wrote, and you will, Patrick and Laura, you will point him to and help him to understand and respond to that call by trusting in the Lord Jesus as his one hope, as this passage marks out for us. As he grows, you'll teach him to grasp for himself all the promises that you claim today on his behalf, and you will anticipate and rejoice as we all will as you see the work of the Spirit in Wilder, and he grasps these promises and exhibits trust in his Savior. This morning before we baptize Wilder, I have some vows for Patrick and Laura, for you. So I ask you, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises in His behalf, and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus for His salvation, even as you do for your own? Do you? And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God, and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray 
with him and for him. That you will teach him the doctrines of our holy faith and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, do you? Wilder wants to say something. (laughs) He is saying something. (laughs) Also, this morning, a vows for you as a congregation, as as this little one will be admitted into the membership of Covenant Church this morning, question for you. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? Do you? Okay, buddy, you ready for this? Lawrence Wilder Andrews, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Elder Bill Hughes, I invite you to pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this special day, and may you call upon Wilder to know you, to follow you, to walk with you all the days of his life. May he early in life know your, your deep grace, your deep, deep, big love. May you help uh, Laura and Patrick to raise him well and to respond well to the gospel. Help them as they, as they grow him. And Lord, help us to walk alongside them all as uh, we are a local body called to uh, support each other and to help these young ones to come and grow up to know you deeply and genuinely. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let's welcome little Wilder by singing to him, Jesus Loves Me. Y'all make sure you greet and welcome little Wilder. Well, it's appropriate as we just have uh, had a baptism and reflected on our responsibility to uh, children among us now to hear a ministry spotlight about our parenting conference, Raising Boys and Girls. I'm going to invite Kelly Robinson and Josh Fickert forward to tell us more about that. Good morning. As we just promised that we would walk alongside that precious family, we've promised in so many other families that we would walk alongside our families at Covenant Church. And Josh and I are here this morning because the youth, school, and children's ministries are all partnering together to sponsor our upcoming parenting conference on March 3rd and 4th. David Thomas and Sissy Goff from Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee will be coming to speak with us and share what they're learning on a daily basis as they work with kids of all ages. Between the two of them, they have over 50 years of experience counseling kids and families and have written 19 books, including one that our young moms group uses used as a study a few years back, encouraging families to look at emotional, social, and spiritual milestones for their children. David and Sissy also have a podcast called Raising Boys and Girls. On Friday evening, March the 3rd, the topic will be anxiety and worry. As we know, anxiety affects one of every four children of all ages. And in that session, David and Sissy will help us understand the differences between anxiety and worry. They'll equip us with strategies for coping and helping to build resilience. And then on Saturday, March 4th, we'll dive into our relationships with our children at each stage from really young ones all the way through. The session is designed to provide tools and support for your parenting or your grandparenting journey. Over the past several years, I've had the privilege of hearing David and Sissy speak a couple of times and have always walked away so encouraged and with practical tips to help with my teens at home, the kids here at church, and even to care for myself well. 
So I'd encourage you to sign up to join us through this QR code. They're in the flyers in the Narthex, but there's also one in your bulletin. And the other reason why I'm up here, why we are up here this morning, is to ask for your help and for your prayers. Most of the couple hundred of attendees who have registered so far are from outside of our church community. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to embrace our mission of deep roots and wide reach as we care for and minister to these families. But we do need about a dozen volunteers for each session, and we have roles for everybody. Greeters, parking lot help, check-in tables, refreshments, book table. We want to ensure that everyone who comes and joins us is cared for well. So would you please consider serving at either the Friday evening or the Saturday morning sessions. You can participate in the conference when you are not serving. You can email Jacqueline. Her email address is in that front uh, page of your bulletin. You can email the church office or you can email me. My email address is on the top of the back of your bulletin. Finally, no matter if you're able to join us on March 3rd and 4th or not, would you please pray for the conference? Please pray that through our time together, we would come away equipped and encouraged for engaging and caring with our children of all ages. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kelly and Josh. Well, let's just do that. Let's do just what Kelly asked. To, let's, as we go to prayer for our church, let's do pray about the conference as well. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we do thank you for these little ones who are among us, uh, Wilder and many others who we take vows to and make promises that we would assist parents in the raising of covenant children. Lord, you are delighted when you see children grow and respond to the promises that have been given to them and grow and trust in the Lord. We pray, Lord, that, um, that even as this parenting conference comes in early March, that you would use it in a powerful way, not only for the families in our own church, but for other families who will be attending as well. It is certainly the case that we need your grace as we parent our children with the many challenges that they face and that we face as we assist as aunts and uncles, as grandparents, and uh, as church members in uh, raising and uh, caring for those little lives under our charge. So, Lord, would you use this conference? Would you bring the people that you want to be there? Would you gather the volunteers who are necessary and, and use that as a means to further the work of your church? Lord, this morning as we pray, we as well lift to you members of Covenant Church specifically. This morning we pray for members of the Lecters fold. We thank you for Dan Lecters and Debbie. Uh, we thank you uh, especially that um, this year that Dan is able to have a sabbatical year from the session, and we pray that that would be, uh, that this year would be a time of, of rest and refreshment uh, for Dan. We thank you for his work uh, caring for those under his care, and uh, Lord, we pray that you would refresh him during this time. Pray as well for he and Debbie and for uh, their work at teaching uh, as they minister to students and pray that you'd make them effective in doing that. We pray for their children, for Alyssa and Caleb and Owen. For Alyssa, she graduates from Calvin and moves on to law school as Caleb considers uh, and makes decisions about a future career. We give thanks for Owen and for their exchange student, Adriel. Thank you that they are thriving and doing well at Westminster. I pray that you'd continue to lead all of them. We pray for the Bryan family, for Eric and Emily, for their children, Everett and Ada and Brendice. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would continue to lead that family, that they would uh, trust in you in all that they do. Pray for Patrick and Laura Andrews and for a little Wilder, who we just had the privilege of baptizing this morning. Lord, we pray that uh, you would continue to Give Patrick and Laura all that they need as they navigate a busy semester, this semester in seminary, but do so with uh, their new baby. We pray as well that you would provide for them all that they need and that they would depend on you for those things. We pray for Mary Bell. We thank you for her work among us here on staff at Covenant Church. As she continues her studies for her doctor of ministry, we pray that you would uh, help her to benefit from that work and uh, provide for her in all the ways that she needs. We pray as well that 
you would allow her to continue to love and serve the people of covenant in a way that brings honor to your name. Lord, we lift before you as well the Davitt family, for Brad and Melissa and for Ethan and Colin and Aiden. We pray that um, you would allow all of them to be sensitive to your leading and direction. Pray that especially for uh, Aiden and for uh, Colin as Colin awaits the outcome of medical school applications and for Ethan as well as he begins clinical rotations in his second year of medical school. Well, we thank you for those whom you have been ministering to uh, with regard to their health needs. We give thanks that Beth Unger is out of the hospital here, she and Steve here worshiping among us this morning. We pause to give you thanks and uh, thank you for the way that you have provided and have answered our prayers in that regard. Lord, we pray as well for those who represent our widest reach. And this morning we lift to you Craig and Jen Harris. Thank you for their work of church planting in Yakima, Washington. Lord, we pray that uh, you would especially be with uh, Craig and Jen and their church as they open up their first elder and deacon nominations and plan to start training at the end of February. Please guide and lead their church in ways that would lead to health and that would bring glory to your name. Pray as well for Frank Harrell for his work with Mission to the World in Japan. And we pray, Lord, especially that in his uh, various preaching and teaching opportunities that you'd cause his work to bear fruit, especially in the two Bible studies that Frank leads among uh, kids and the English classes that he teaches. Lord, make his work effective, and we pray that it would extend your kingdom and uh, glorify your name. Lord, we're thankful that we can bring all of these things to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, and even for things that we have not named among you but that are heavy on our hearts. We lift those to you this morning and ask that you would hear all these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. During our next hymn, during the last verse of our next hymn, I'll invite children ages four through first grade to meet their worship leaders for children's worship in the narthex, and they can make their way down to the Heartland Room. As we sing our next hymn, I'm going to go ahead and invite the ushers to come forward, and as you give your offering, as you offer yourself to the Lord in the tithe and in His offering, let's also prepare to hear God's Word. Let's do that by standing and singing together, Be Thou My Vision.
be seated. Turning our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, you can also find our passage uh, in your worship guide. A moment ago, we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, uh, for the Bible tells me so. That may be the most profound thing we've all said together today. How do we know that Jesus loves us? The Bible tells us that truth, and we cherish it for our lives. There are some passages, like John chapter 3, verse 16, that resonate with us. There are other passages in the Bible that feel more radioactive than resonant, especially in this cultural moment. We're coming to one of those passages that, that's confusing for us because it speaks of something that pushes against our hearts. Submission, this notion of subjecting ourselves one to another. And here, Peter does not speak of subjection only to wives, as we sometimes say, but he speaks of it to both husbands and wives. He's been speaking about subjection all the way since chapter 2. As he continues that story, he's spoken of it in the context of the state, in the context of the workplace or master-servant relations, and now he speaks of it in the context of that most complicated of institutions, marriage. Let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 3. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be in the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves." by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This is the word of the Lord. Let us give thanks to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that these words seem foreign to our ears, not because we haven't read them before, but because we, we now live in a world where they no longer resonate with what is good and true and beautiful. And so we pray this morning that, that You would guide us by Your Spirit into all truth, and, and that we might see more clearly the, the face of our Savior, who, who willingly subjected Himself to us. It will he subjected himself to the curse of our sin. And in so doing, Lord, was submitted completely unto you out of your great, deep, and abiding love for us. Might we follow him into that mutual service as we think about the callings that you have for us. And may you, O oh God, make us mindful of our responsibility, not the responsibility of the, the one who sits near or is even not here, that these words are what you would speak to our hearts, not what we have in mind for, for somebody else's heart. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy name. Amen. A little seven-year-old girl, and she had just seen the movie Cinderella for the first time, and she was so excited about the story. I mean, you can try to remember the first time you saw the movie or read the story, and, and she wanted to share the story with her next-door neighbor, an elderly lady, who, when she had heard about her going to see the movie, was just as excited to talk about what she had learned and, and all of the um, parts of the, that story. They got back, they were talking, and, and the elderly neighbor said to her, you know, I know what happens at the end of the movie. Um, Cinderella and the prince, um, you, you know, they live happily ever after. And the little girl said, oh, no, they didn't. They got married. <laughs> and, and, and we laugh, right? Maybe her response was, was innocent, but, but marriage no longer means happily ever after. Today, bringing up marriage can bring profound 
sorrow, of marriages broken, of vows um, trashed, deep cynicism. Is this institution even worthwhile or, or is it even workable? In 1960, 70% of all adults were married. In 1960, 70% of all adults were married in the United States. 60% of 20-somethings were married. Today, only 20% of 20-somethings are married. Marriage used to be the norm. Now it's the exception. An exceptional marriage is exceedingly rare. We've lost the belief that marriage is something special. It feels more like the other things in our lives, commodities, the things we buy, trade, sell, consume. But when it serves its purpose, we embrace its use. But when it's no longer purposeful, when it's no longer fulfilling a need, then then we discard it. When it's become costly, it can be abandoned. And I say all that not not to surprise you, but rather to to remind us we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that the world around us and its view of marriage is different from the view of marriage that we're giving in the Scriptures. Peter knew that when he was writing this letter. He, He didn't expect the readers to think that the Christian view of marriage would fit the secular view of marriage. That, in fact, Peter reminds us back in verse 11 that we're strangers and aliens, sojourners, that we serve a different master who has called us to a different pattern of life, that the pattern of life that we're called to lead in this world follows after Jesus, our Savior. We submit to a different authority in this world. And because we have submitted our lives to a different authority and have participated in the grace that our Savior has brought, we are now able to live a different kind of life. Peter speaks about this earlier in chapter 2, verse 16. If you have your Bibles open, just go back there and look with me. He writes, live as people who are free. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Do you hear, do you hear the logic of, of what Peter's saying? He's saying that by virtue of our participation in the gospel of grace, as a consequence of our having become Christians, we now have the capacity to live as a free people. And that freedom is preeminently displayed in the service that we offer one to another. The freedom that we have in Jesus Christ is preeminently displayed in how we conduct ourselves one to another in all of the relationships that we have in this this life. Peter's giving us a context to understand this notion of subjection, this notion of submission that we have such a big problem with, right? right? Subjection is bad. Submission is bad because the notion of submission is that I am less. You are more important, so I give you this honor. But Peter's inverting that order. He's saying that we have more. We have everything that we need. By virtue of that more, we show honor. We think about how we conduct ourselves with the state. Even when it's unjust, we conduct ourselves in master-servant relationships, or we would say in the workplace today, and especially in the context of Christian and even non-Christian marriage. But when you have a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse, how do you conduct yourself in that context? And Peter, again, pushes us back to this notion of submission, subjection. And the reason why is because submission, the seemingly insignificant act of submission, is the window in which the gospel's beauty shines. Through the seemingly insignificant act of submission, subjecting our lives one to another, the beauty of the gospel shines. We show the beauty of Christ to others when we act like Jesus. But, but that's hard. 
That's hard. And so we need to think about that as we think about the context of, of marriage. The first thing I want us to notice here about the context of marriage that Peter's giving us, one to another, and I understand. He, he says the first part he talks to wives, then he talks to husbands. But what I want us to begin to notice is first what he's saying about both men and women, husbands and wives, that, that we need to not maximize the differences. We need to maximize what we share so that we can better understand the distinctions of our callings in the context of, of marriage. And what P Peter's saying here is likewise, likewise, verse 1, verse 7, and he's flowing back in what he's already spoken about all the way back to 2, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So he's saying to husbands and wives the same thing. The husbands have a call to subjection. Wives have a call to subjection. Servants have a call to subjection. Masters have a call to subjection. Citizens have a call to subjection. Likewise. But, but then notice, he, he says that the motivation for that is we're equal heirs of grace. Right? V verse 7, since they, that is wives, he's speaking to husbands, are equal heirs with you of the grace of life. So, so wives are just like husbands. Believers, participants in the story of the gospel, which is also the reminder of, of how we move towards the other in relationship. The, the assumption of the culture is radically different than the Christian assumption about how marriage works. What's marriage about? But what is the culture's view of marriage? But, well, today we idolize a good marriage, a healthy marriage, the perfect spouse, as the one who fulfill my needs. Right? This is what our culture is telling us, that if I can just find the perfect one, they will meet my needs and satisfy my longings. This is what marriage is for. This is what it's about. In fact, it's one of the dominant threads in, in the great debate regarding same-sex marriage, a, a debate which is I, I now over in terms of the politics of it. But why would the state deny a person's right to be happy and fulfilled? It just doesn't make any sense. That's what marriage is for. The, the Christian's view of marriage is, is far more significant and, and nuanced, but if marriage is only about our personal happiness then why would we exclude it to anybody? And that's what we think about marriage. Marriage is to be happy. An article, it's from several years ago, it was titled, Marriage of Us, Just Try, Try Again. It talks about Rhonda Hale, who runs a, a, a wedding shop. I mean, we, we see all of these all around us. And in this wedding shop, she... Um, is delivering, you know, the wares for a perfect ceremony. It's about the dress. It's about the reception. The marriage is optional, right? It's about the celebration. It's about the event. If it doesn't work out, well, you can try again. You can move on. She talks about how... Um, the, the, the term starter marriage has been introduced. We can start, figure some things out, and then try better the next time. That one person was quoted as saying, we have disposable relationships. You can use it for the benefits you derive when you don't derive any true benefits or the next relationship gives you a better amount of pleasure. You can end it. You can say, okay, I'm th through, M moving on. This is how the world sees marriage. It's for me. It's something I consume. It, it, it's something that, that I, can, I, I can advance myself through. And, and if it no longer serves that purpose, then, then I can move on from it. The truth is, what, what we're doing when we think about marriage that way, as we're committing the age-old sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. What, what did Eve think when she saw the fruit, right? She, she thought that this was something that will advance 
her own ascent into personhood. This is, this is the thing that God's been holding out on. We thought God had given us everything that we need, and then we learned that He hadn't. There's one more thing in the world that He had made that I need in order to be happy, and she took it. And then she gave it to her husband, Adam, right? And we do the same thing over and over and over again. Every time we think that we're going to derive some benefit, some sense of our identity, some um, uh, aspect of our fulfillment from what God has made in this world, right? We, We do that with our jobs. We do that with substances, alcohol and food. We do that with entertainment. We do that with our children. And we do it with our spouse. We we think, you are going to fulfill me. You are going to satisfy me. You are the means through which I will become a better and more satisfied person. Ethicist Stanley Harris speaks to this pointedly. Destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes marriage and the family are primarily institutions of personal fulfillment necessary for us to become whole and happy. The assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry and that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. This moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. But we never know who we marry, we just think we do. Or even if we do marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage being the enormous thing that it is means we are not the same person after we've entered it. The primary challenge of marriage is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. It's true. If we come to the place where we think that this person that I'm married to is going to remedy my loneliness, is going to satisfy my sexual needs, if they're going to make me feel important, acknowledge my authority, if they're going to help me maximize getting my way, then you are going to be sorely disappointed because they cannot deliver on that promise. They, they cannot. No matter who they are, they will not deliver that promise. That, that, that's impossible. That, that God-shaped whole, common to each one of us as a consequence of our sin, cannot be addressed by our spouse. Several years ago, I was in New York City, and I got to visit Ground Zero. And some of you, if you've seen Ground Zero, you know the two massive squared fountains that are the um, the, the, the building print, as it were, of the Twin Towers. And these two squared fountains, the water is cascading into a bottom that you cannot see. The, the water is just cascading. And I feel it's certain that the image is meant to portray the sense of loss and tragedy that, that came to the 3,000 families whom had loved ones that they lost, and also the sense of loss that that we share corporately as a nation and the tragedy of that event, that the water can fall forever and not fill the void. You just can't account for that kind of loss. And when I think of the heart, the human heart, I, I think that picture is still inadequate. How much, how much darkness is within us that we seek to fill from the things of this world? That no matter how much it is, I can guarantee you that the person you're married to will not be sufficient. That nor will the person you want to be married to or you dream about becoming married to. That person cannot do it. Marriage is not about two halves making a whole. That, that's what our culture says, right? The key to oneness, that you are my half. We're going to come together and make the whole. Now, the 
picture of Christian marriage is not finding my half in the other to make me whole. It's finding my life in Christ and then giving myself to the other. Oneness is not achieved by what I get from my spouse. Oneness is achieved by what I've already been given in Christ and then giving it to my spouse. It's not what I'm going to get from them. It's what I'm going to give to them. And that's the logic of the gospel, right? If we're equal heirs of grace, we are to give grace because we've been given grace. That's the summons that Peter gives us in this passage. And it's that grace that makes sense of the submission we're called to offer one to the other. Yes, as we we think about this passage, of course, Peter is assuming the Christian design of marriage. This is God's institution. It cannot be set aside. It can't even be set aside when it's not meeting my needs. Peter recognizes that the enduring character of marriage, something like this would have been his definition, a lifelong covenant relationship between a man and a woman reflecting God's creative Um, His distinctive and covenantal design for the purposes of companionship, procreation, growth, and love. Now, now somewhere along the lines here at Covenant Church, you've heard a definition like that of marriage. That's not new. This is God's institution. He's given it to husbands and wives, men and women, to reflect His beauty, His creativity, His distinctive design in a lifelong covenant relationship for companionship, procreation, our own growth and love, that we might reflect the gospel. This is what Peter is committed to. What's surprising about what Peter's saying to husbands and wives here is he's saying that design endures even if your spouse doesn't share it, even if they're not a Christian. This is what what he's saying to wives Be subject to your husband even if they don't obey the word. That is, they're not Christians, that they haven't come to Christ. But that they may be won by the conduct of their their wives. Peter's saying that there's a way of conducting ourselves that bears witness to the gospel that is so compelling and beautiful that it becomes the occasion of our spouse becoming a believer. This isn't about a formula. It's about internalizing the gospel to such a degree that our life and conduct makes Christ beautiful. So beautiful that a husband would then consider the gospel and they themselves would enter into life in Christ. Some of you may know this. Augustine's mother, Monica, we often hear about her. We don't hear about his father, Patricius, who died when Augustine was 17, and right before he died, a year before he had died, he had been baptized. Through the good conduct of Monica, Augustine's mother, Patricius, was famously a pagan, but at the end of his life, he came to faith and trust in Christ. Even as Peter speaks about here, in our passage. Similarly, in the ancient world, a man could set aside a wife even faster than a man can do that today. And it would have been tempting if you were a male believer that your wife had not joined the conversation, as, as it were. Can I set her aside? Peter says, no. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor her. It's not about setting her aside when she doesn't agree or doesn't want to go along or somehow is cramping your, your style. That's not the pattern of the gospel. That's not the pattern of Christ. That doesn't cohere with grace. Grace calls us to live with our wives. It's like famously Robertson McQuilkin, who was the president of then Columbia International University, in the prime of his life, he was serving that institution, and his wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and she began a rapid decline. And in response, Dr. McQuilkin didn't 
set his wife aside. He, he ended up setting his post aside. He resigned from the presidency, and then he became the primary caregiver for his wife during those years. And what he did was a complete shock, not only to the campus community, but also to the uh, medical community in Columbia, South Carolina. Dr. McQuicken didn't know why until an oncologist told him, almost all women stand by their men. Very few men stand by their women. And yet, what Peter is saying here, to men, even when it's not convenient, even when it cramps your style, stand by your women. Stand by them because that is the gospel way. As we live according to the enduring design that our God has given to us in marriage. And it's only then that we can then wade into these very specific applications that that Peter gives to us here. Because if we go straight from design to duty and we leave out grace, then these these passages will, will then end up becoming the occasion for disagreement and division. How else can can we read, okay, you need to submit to me. That's not what this passage is telling husbands to say to their wives. (laughs) First of all, it's talking to wives and husbands about their duties in light of the gospel. So, So what is Peter saying to wives? Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And we don't have to skirt the issue, but various definitions have been offered to define submission, a disposition to yield, voluntary yielding in love, not to exercise authority over, I'm sure there are others and even better, but the clear clear thought here is submission. It includes the, the acknowledgement of the authority of the husband that must be exercised according to actions and an attitude. That's what it's speaking about. It's speaking about a real deference, a real willingness to give up oneself towards the husband, recognizing that this is, this is beautiful to Christ because it reflects the very pattern of Christ towards you. And these comments about outward adornment, we're not to press those too far, because the point here is not a restriction on any kind of outward adornment or beauty, as much as it is recognizing the relative distinction between outward adornment versus inner beauty. Peter's point is, never confuse outward adornment with the beauty of a transformed life. Don't waste your time on outward adornment. May our focus be on the cultivation, cultiva, uh, cultivation of the character, the inner character of the, of the person. Because the context here is winning the husband. That no matter how beautiful we are, it will never rival the beauty of love. It will never rival the beauty of genuine respect. It will never rival the beauty of genuinely seeking the heart of another. And that's why, friends, it's important that we not misunderstand Peter's words. These words are not to be used against a wife to maximize a husband's sense of authority or even to manage his own insecurity. This is not about a wife giving something to her husband out of a sense of of his deficit, to give back something that he needs, or because you don't have something that he does. That would be the world's definition of authority relationships. No, what Peter is saying is that we give this kind of honor and respect because of what I have. This isn't born of a, of a gospel of scarcity. This is born out of a gospel of abundance. And that's why these verses flow even into Christian marriage. 
because now we actually have the tools to do this even more effectively. How beautiful is it But when my husband shares that identity, shares the same faith commitment, that that ought to make me even more ready and willing uh, to honor him in the way that Christ calls me to honor and compliment him. Doesn't make it easy. But but it does help that, that Peter says something almost the same to husbands. What does he say to wives? Be subject to your own husbands, so that they may be one. To to husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor. Showing honor. You know, one of the greatest temptations for a woman in marriage is to forget her identity in Christ and so usurp authority. But the husband, one of his greatest temptations is forget his identity in Christ and abnegate his authority. right? But wives, let me do that. Husbands, why don't you do that? But why don't you just do that? And I'm going to go, I'm going to go. But both are wrong, but both aren't of Christ. And what does Peter say to the man? To the man, he says, don't go, live. Don't leave, live. Dwell with your wife. Stay. It's beautiful, isn't it? It sounds exactly like what Jesus has done with us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling place among us. But what did Jesus do? He came to live with us. He he came to make His dwelling place with us. He he came to be among us. He he submitted Himself to our flesh that, that He might save us. And in the same way, husbands are called to live with their wives, literally in an understanding way. Which is a statement, what? About subjection, submission. We might say adjustment. Husbands, adjust your lives to your wives. Doing that, knowing them, knowing who they are. And that's what he means by their weakness. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Boy, that's a, that's a loaded word, right? Again, because in our mind, weak, weakness implies inferiority, it implies less than. P- P- Peter's point here is not to say that the wife is less or inferior, but to recognize certain limitations and vulnerabilities, especially in the ancient world. There would have been positional vulnerabilities related to the rights that, that wouldn't have been common to a wife in those days. And he's saying, don't exploit those vulnerabilities. Don't take advantage of those vulnerabilities. In fact, make sure she's not taken advantage of. Make sure she's not in a position of weakness. Make sure you're coming alongside her in those ways. And then even today, we can recognize that the physical strength of men and women is different. Don't exploit that vulnerability. Don't take advantage of that vulnerability for yourself, but but show honor to your wife. Subject yourself to your wife. Be, Be subject to them. I mean, it really is a beautiful picture, isn't it, that God gives husbands and wives, each to the other, to be like who? Jesus. But what is God calling us to be in our marriage? He's calling us to be a little Jesus to our spouse. He's calling you to be the best version of Jesus that you possibly can in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we do that preeminently through the act of submission. We do that preeminently not by demanding our rights or getting our way, but giving them up in a way that shows honor to our spouse as we live according to God's enduring design in marriage. Years ago, I was on a college mission project in Belize, and several of the teenage boys in the community that we were in, they wanted to play American football. You know, they had their moment, tell us how to play American football. And so we gathered them all up, and 
divided everybody into teams, and as I recall, I was going to be the all-time quarterback, and from the first snap, I knew that this was not going to go well. Um, you know, I, I snapped the ball, and tr- trying to get across the idea of, of a play is, is, is challenging, and I, you know, I threw the ball, and, and uh, the, this little boy, he was running around. I'm not sure he was running toward the end zone or which end zone. Um, but, but before long, he's running, and then he throws the ball to uh, another boy, not sure if he was on our team. And, and it was very clear, very quickly, that, that we weren't going to play American football. That this wasn't e- even soccer or rugby. I mean, we weren't playing football. We were playing with a football. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it didn't matter. Because it was about having fun, right? That's, that's what it was about. It was about having fun. The stakes, though, are different when it concerns the institution of marriage. We're not playing. Lives are at stake. And Peter's calling us to submit ourselves to the enduring design that God has given to us in marriage, but we can't just go from directives to duty. Friends, we have to go through Jesus. But we have to go through grace. But we have to go through the pattern of the gospel. Uh, Otherwise, we will shipwreck both ourselves and our spouse. So, So friends, we can only do this thing we call Christian marriage through the lens of the cross. And when we do, as husbands and wives, we become the very hands and feet of Jesus as we show the beauty of grace one to another. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We pray that You would sanctify us according to Your Spirit, that we might live as husbands and wives, as those who long to be husbands and wives, that we might live as You have called us to, showing grace one to another. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I might invite the elders to join me as we prepare to come to the table, and I'd also invite the balcony if they want to go ahead and make their way down. Um, We we do come to this table, which is the table that Jesus has set for us uh, that reminds us of our great need for Christ. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every week because like we need the Word spoken, we need the Word made visible. Because the Christian life, as I said a moment ago, is not lived from duty, I mean directive to duty. It's not just we need more information, right? We need empowerment and transformation and change. And that empowerment, transformation, and change does not bubble up from within us naturally. It has to flow forth through the streams of living water that are found in Jesus Christ and that work that He's done on the cross. And that's why we come to the table, because we need Jesus. Every hour I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. This is also why we say this table is for those who believe. It's it's not a table for you to figure the gospel out while you're partaking. It's It's a time for you to contemplate the gospel before you come. And then coming, we receive and are strengthened in the Christian life. If you've yet to put your faith and trust in Him, come and talk with me or one of the elders here or deacons. I know they'd love to talk to you about being a follower of Jesus. As we prepare to partake, let's pray uh, to our Savior. Jesus, we pray You would come now and be with us by Your Spirit, using these ordinary elements of bread and wine that You instituted so many years ago, that we might, Your people, be strengthened and sustained in the Christian journey, that we would remember your great atoning work. How sufficient is your forgiveness for us, throwing our sins as far as the east is from the west, that you would, um, Lord, fill us with your Spirit, that we would overflow in the knowledge of your love and love for one another, and that you would also remind us of the great promise that what we partake of today is but a foretaste of an everlasting banquet feast. And we pray, Jesus, you would come quickly for your people. We pray in your holy name. Amen.
On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread as I am ministering in his name. Take this bread. And when he had given thanks, as we have done, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he had taken the bread, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ has died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Let us come to the feast.
The body of Christ given for you, take and eat. His blood shed for you, take and drink. Let us stand that we may receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Go in his peace. Amen.